what an awesome, awesome evening we have so far. Um, and I'm actually going to come up and we'll be doing a series at the minute called um, What Would Jesus Say To? And then fill in the blank. Um, and so far we realize that Jesus has a lot to say about a lot of things, um, which he's very much entitled to. Um, have such opinion being God and and somebody asked well, what are you doing tonight are you doing what Jesus is going to say to an astronaut um, looking at my jump and I was like that sounds like much more exciting preach but I'm actually doing what Jesus is going to say to a skeptic this evening and if you guys I don't know what you guys like but if you're anywhere where I was um, during that worship and during that ministry time I think there's very very much few people left here who are skeptics um, of how good God is so I'm definitely preaching to the converted but yeah, so skepticism, um, actually we've all been there. I hate to break it to you that we're all actually skeptics at some point. The likelihood is in the last few hours, you've all been a skeptic in one way, shape or form, um, be it over the cake or which way you, to drive to church. Maybe you had a different point of view of the uh, route you took. But we've all been a skeptic, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, being a skeptic actually can be um, good. There's wisdom in it. And it's defined, when I looked at it, it's defined as a person who is inclined to doubt or to question. And when I saw that, it's a person inclined to doubt, um, and I started praying into what um, to speak on this evening, and I saw this skeptic as a person inclined to doubt. I thought, well, Lord, clearly I'm going to speak about doubting Thomas. Um, I went to I went to St. Thomas's primary school. I've l always had Thomas as um, a character that I know much about. And I was like, okay, awesome. Doubting Thomas is what we're going to go for. And as I started praying into it, the Lord said, actually, we should stop calling him Doubting Thomas. He's had such an unfair rep because actually he's the Apostle Thomas. But Thomas was an apostle, and he's incredited, if you read up on him, he's the person who took Christianity, he took the message of the gospel um, in the first century into India, and churches that he started are still existing today, yet us being skeptics that we are, we just refer to him the whole time as Doubting Thomas. And he's done so much more than that, so we're going to um, break that uh, story down this evening. Um, so we're going to look at the story of Doubting Thomas. It's in John 20. If you have your Bibles with you this evening and you want to turn to that, we're going to look at John um, chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. And while you're searching for that, let's give a bit of context. At this point, where we're going to pick up the story, um, Jesus has been crucified. He's um, hung on the cross. They put nails into his hands. And that's to make him hang on the cross, and they pierced his side with a sword to ensure that he is dead. Um, all his followers, his apostles, his disciples have seen this happen. But as he promised, he has come back to life. And this is him, Jesus starting to reveal himself as being risen again. So we pick up the story at this point. So John 20, um, 24 to 20, 29, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see his hands, the, see in his hands the hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So it's this awesome story that many of us growing up to Sunday school knew. Um, as I said, British culture likes to refer to Thomas as Doubting Thomas. Um, and it's that moment of Thomas' skepticism. All his friends, his peers, the other disciples had seen Jesus, but Thomas was skeptic to begin with. And that's my first point of what would Jesus say, is that Jesus would actually say to a skeptic, let me show you too. You see, Thomas was actually just late to the party, he was not inherently skeptical. It wasn't his nature, as I already explained, that he did great works for the kingdom. It wasn't he was a doubtful person. It wasn't part of his identity. Actually, it's perfectly natural. He's seen Jesus die. 
somebody raised from the dead isn't a normal thing. It's not a logical conclusion any, any of us would have came to at that point in time. His fear of what was happening around him made him come to that conclusion in that time when he said, actually, I too want to see um, the wounds in the hand and the wound in Jesus' side when he was crucified. And Jesus would say, let me show you too, because the disciples only believed because Jesus had already shown himself to them. They weren't skeptics at that point because they had been witness to what Jesus had done. Jesus had appeared to them already and showed himself. You see, even earlier on in John 20, when Mary Magdalene is at the tomb, she's the one who finds Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus appears to her as well in the same way. And her only conclusion is it must be the gardener. Such was her skepticism of the fact that Jesus could be raised from the dead. It's a natural thing that a lot of us do. And as I said already, that the other disciples, they had already seen Jesus. And it was Jesus in that encounter with the disciples to begin with, was the person who said, here, yeah, here are the wounds. Jesus had to show the wounds to all the other disciples as well. So Thomas asking to see them is a logical thing. It's something we all would have done, and it was actually his way of getting his human brain, his tiny human brain, around a great wonder, the greatest wonder that God ever done, is he asked to just see some evidence. You see, what Jesus does is he always backs up what he says with proof. He always backs up what he says with proof. In this case, he shows he has no problem in showing the wounds he went up to Thomas, obviously he knew Thomas's request, and he went up to Thomas proudly and said, here it is. These are wounds actually set for a criminal. It was a criminal's death, but Jesus didn't hide it. Jesus still had the wounds on show. He could have came back with a perfect body again, but Jesus was showing off his wounds because he was proud of them, such as his love for what he did for us on the cross, that he was willing to show it off. And it's the same with all things that Jesus asks from us. He says, I will back it up with proof. For example, for me personally, something of the Christian faith that um, us as a church believe in is that a person can get slain in the spirit, that the spirit can, can come on a person so heavily that they can't handle it and they end up falling to the floor and the physical, but it's just an outward sign of the spirit is coming upon them. And I grew up in church and I have an awesome Christian family, but I grew up being told that being slain in the spirit is something that's not of God at all. And I was highly skeptical of it. And it is something, unfortunately, that often is taken out of context and used wrongly. But I was a huge skeptic of being slain in the spirit. And God, in his sense of humor, we were at a um, church conference, and we had a guest speaker. And this guest speaker came and started praying for people. And as the person prayed for them, and she just prayed for them and put um, her hand on them, people were falling. And I stood in the queue, watching people fall and fall and fall. And I said, Lord, if this person pushes me, I'm going to be so mad. Because that's what I, my belief was. Such was my skeptic. Because I thought anyone who's ever been slain clearly couldn't just hold themselves properly when they got pushed. And genuinely, that was my belief. That was my belief entirely. And God, in his sense of humor, this woman came to about this close, and there I fell. She didn't touch me at all. And I remember, and I went on to have this glorious revelation, one of the best moments of my faith, of understanding Christ in that moment. And that's what actually God's saying, hold on, let me show you too. I've already shown other people, so let me show you. Your skepticism is because I haven't shown you yet what I can do and where I can be. You see, that's the first bit of why someone can be a skeptic, is they just need to see. Jesus needs to reveal himself to that person. Maybe he's revealed himself to you in that way, and we need patience, and we need to pray and intercede and ask the Lord to reveal himself to that person we're praying for. But actually, there's a different element sometimes to why we can be skeptical, and that's a lack of faith. We've been talking about faith a lot already this evening, but actually faith is something we all have. We all have faith in Christ, and faith is a gift. I don't know if you knew that, that faith is actually a gift. We get given faith in different levels to each person, and why God gives a level of faith to one person differently to another, I don't know. That's part of his great divine mystery, but it's part of what the scripture says. And this actually leads me to my second point of what Jesus would say. And Jesus would say, rather choose to be blessed. You see, in that story I read, Jesus' last 
phrase to Thomas. He says, Jesus said to him, this is verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You see, there's something about faith that really speaks to the hearts of God. Having faith for the impossible shows an authority, and God being God and the ultimate authority, he sees that authority, and he sees that it looks like him, and therefore he blesses it. That's why he says, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Faith is something that just makes hearts God, the heart of God come alive so greatly. And actually, for all of us here, I don't know, you get people today who have a grace and they've seen um, Jesus, they've had visions of Jesus, but for most of us, I presume, that we haven't. I haven't seen Jesus in the flesh or what's something I believe or got the, um, you know, in any of your visions, I have seen Jesus in the flesh. I know him, I know his voice, I know his presence, I know his goodness, and I know his love, but I haven't seen him in the flesh. So actually for us here, yeah, we're actually walking in that blessing. Those of us who believe in Jesus, yeah, we are walking that blessing. I have not seen him in the flesh, yet I believe in him entirely. And that's what Jesus is saying. Rather choose to be blessed. If you're a skeptic here, there's a blessing on offer. Jesus is saying here in that sentence, I'm holding out this blessing to take the faith, something that looks like me, and I'm going to bless it. So rather choose to be blessed in your skepticism. Rather choose to step out of it and take faith. However, there's a huge difference here between skepticism and cynicism. A skeptic requires to have a bit of evidence, and then they believe. It's almost like a wisdom technique to make sure you are stepping where you understand, where a cynic will say, I don't believe, and that's it, and you're not going to change my mind on it. A skeptic is still offer open to having evidence given to them. But a cynic says, no, you see, when Jesus was raised, Thomas was skeptical, but the evidence was presented to him, and he said that my Lord and my God. You see, when the Pharisees saw the evidence of Jesus being raised, they were cynics. They started lying. They started spreading untrue facts about Jesus because they refused to believe. They were cynical. There's a huge difference between the two. But we need to work to that point of having huge levels of undiluted faith. And Jesus is offering this blessing. You see, there's almost like this, um, when I was praying into it, I saw almost like this gradient chart between being a cynic, being someone who has no faith whatsoever, and nothing's going to change it. And you add a little bit of faith, and you become a skeptic, someone who requires a bit of evidence, a bit of proof, a bit of something in the natural for you to believe. And then you get to a point of having a childlike faith where your faith is just so strong and the scriptures tell us to have a childlike faith that we will believe anything of God, anything we read, anything the Lord tells of us, we'll believe it straight away. And there's this almost like a gradient. And I wonder if we search our own hearts here, aware within the gradient we're sitting within our faith. Are we actually, if we're truthful to ourselves, are we actually cynical? Is it true that every time somebody gets up, um, Michaela so boldly shared tonight of her testimony, are you sitting here and you're thinking, nope, didn't happen, it was all the moment? Or are you sitting here saying, actually, if I go up to her and talk to her, then I'm going to believe, I'll believe what she says. Or are you a person who, before we started praying, you walked here tonight saying, Jesus is going to be here, therefore there's going to be healings tonight. There's this gradient of faith that we need to get. And I really want the night, if you haven't already, we had such an awesome time of ministry beforehand, but if you haven't already, I want tonight to be the night where you move up the chart where you ask for more faith, and you can go from, Lord, I don't want to be cynical. It's my nature. It's an enemy tactic. And I want to see what those people have, the people that were jumping and rejoicing here. I want to move up the chart. And maybe tonight you can jump from a cynic to a blind faith, or you have to just move up a little bit. Either way, it's a step in the right direction, a step to catching more of Jesus' heart. Christianity actually is a faith of, that has tensions. And by that I mean sometimes they're things that look like contradictions, but they're not. There's something that needs to be held in tension, that we as believers, we read the scriptures and there's like a, a fine line between two things. And a, a cynic will say it's a contradiction, but it's, it's not really. It's a, a tension that we hold. And for what Jesus will say to a skeptic is that there's a tension between blind faith and having wisdom. You see, we are called to have blind faith, but there's a wisdom that comes 
from having that wisdom in there, having a skeptical nature with us to make sure we are steading, stepping where we are meant to, rather than just being led astray. You see, Scripture says in Deuteronomy, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In fact, Jesus himself is recorded in two of the Gospels in quoting this verse in Deuteronomy. And that's kind of having blind faith. It says you just need to believe in your God. Don't put him to the test. That's what Scripture is saying. Yet on the other hand, the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's almost like this invitation to take God up on this offer, experience it, step with wisdom, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see how this tension is being built up here in the Scriptures. And the fact that I can say that it's not a contradiction, it's a tension, is because it's all wrapped up in the fact that Jesus can see our heart's intention in what we do. You know, when we require more knowledge, when we don't understand something and we have to become skeptical of it because we want to step um, carefully and we move away from that blind faith, Jesus doesn't mind it because, as I said already, he has the proof to back it up if we let him. If we say, Lord, I don't understand this, and we come to him humbly with the level of faith that he is God and that he will answer us, Jesus doesn't mind a bit of skepticism. It's when you're a cynic and keep moving the goalpost, and that's when it doesn't catch God's heart. That's when God says your heart is hardened, and I can't break into that. You see, Jesus wasn't offended by Thomas. He said, you've missed out on a blessing, but he didn't rebuke Thomas because he had the proof there. I say he was holding the proof. The proof was his hands. And he had the proof there. He wasn't offended by Thomas' skepticism. And he knows that our brains are smaller than his. The scripture says, my ways are different to your ways. God created us. He knows our brains that we can understand the miracles of his divine nature. He knows that. So skepticism and our misunderstanding, he's aware of. It's not offensive to him. You see, the whole tension between blind faith and wisdom is wrapped up in Jesus' ability to see our hearts. You see, Jesus knew Thomas loved him. He spent time with Thomas, many years with Thomas, traveling, ministering with Thomas there, speaking over many meals. He knew Thomas loved him. Therefore, this moment of doubt that Thomas had was not cynical, and Jesus knew that and didn't rebuke him. John 6, we see... um, we know that Jesus knew the hearts of disciples because he sat around the dinner table and the scripture tells us in John 6 that he saw Judas's heart and he saw Judas will betray him. It's this divine ability Jesus has as God. And actually Jesus still has that ability today. He sees all of our hearts all the time. He sees the inward workings of our heart, our heart's desires, our heart's motivation. That's still a thing he has. Yet also in Mark 9, there's a a story of a a boy that was possessed by demons. And the father came running to Jesus and said, Jesus, help my son. Because the son, the demons within the son, was making the son unwell. And the father, he was skeptical. He's been trying with his son. He's been trying everything he can to bring his son back around and make his son whole. Yet the scripture says that the father said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He was skeptical, but he wasn't a cynic. He says, I don't believe, I don't understand, but Lord, help me believe. Jesus, help me believe. And Jesus saw his heart and then took the demons out of the boy because he saw faith in him still. The father was further along the chart of faith than a cynic. And there was faith and Jesus blessed the faith because it looks like him. Thomas knew where to draw the line. Thomas could have turned around to Jesus once he had seen the wounds in his hands and in his side, and he said, actually, let me see where they whipped you on the back. And then he's going to say, okay, well, walk with me to the tomb. I want to see how you rolled the stone away. Okay, well, I don't believe that still. I want to go back, and I want to know this, that, and the next thing. Thomas didn't keep changing the goalposts. Thomas said, this is my criteria. Lord, show me this. And when God did show him this, when Jesus did show him the wounds, Thomas instantly cried out, my Lord and my God. His criteria was met, and he moved back to blind faith. And that's why he wasn't a cynic, but simply a skeptic. And something that's hugely um, personal to me, see, I don't understand great things of God sometimes. 
I've been uh, blessed to be a youth leader for many years now, and some young people come up to me and they ask me questions um, of things that have happened in their lives, and they say, why has the Lord done this? And I have to turn around and say, I don't know why the Lord did this. And that's because he's greater than me, and his ways are way higher than mine, and my brain compre can't comprehend him. Yet I'm not skeptical of the fact that the Lord is loving. It's because I know what he's done in my life. And people say often, and um, when I was praying into this, I felt the Lord say, I must share this story. And it's crazy. And it's about my cousin, Russell. And there's Russell there. That's Russell Alford. And um, people will say often, if Lord is loving, and God is so loving, why does he do bad things? Why do bad things happen? Why are children born with defects, crippling deformities and um, disabilities? And um, I'll tell you a story now, but it's so crazy because I was going to share the story and I felt the Lord say I must, and I was like, Lord, I can't. And Russell, um, I can count on one hand how many times he's messaged me or phoned me since I've lived in the Isle of Man. And 7 a.m. this morning, my phone rang, and it was Russell. And this last night, the Lord told me I must share the story, and I told the Lord, no, I can't share the story. And Russell phoned me this morning, and I was like, oh, my word, I must tell the story then. And I asked his permission. But Russell, who I love dearly, he's my cousin. He's a few years older than me. He was born, I don't know the medical terms, but the long and short of it was he's born with a hole in his brain. And my family, um, we love him dearly. I wouldn't change him for the world. But even now, he's 27 years old, and he spent the last few months still in hospital getting brain surgery. He's 27 years old, and it's still, oh, I need to stop. And it's still a, an issue for him. And I don't know why God made him that way. And I don't know why that could be, but we love Russell so much. And you see, when Russell was born um, and they saw there was a deformity, the doctors actually said, maybe you should have bought the baby because this baby's going to be no good. And you see Russell there, he's riding a quad bike. He rides, uh, he can drive today. He's got a job. He's actually got four gold medals for cycling in the national games. And Russell, even though he still suffers today, I don't know why God did that, and I don't know that at all, and only when I'm in glory. But through what I have seen of God through Russell, I'm not a skeptic of God's love at all. It's through those little things that I see in Russell and in all things around me that Russell can do all these things that makes me go, Lord, you are loving. I don't know why you made him this way. I will never know why he's this way. But you are loving, and that's taken the skepticism out of my heart. You see, even when people come to me, I say, Jesus has changed me so much. I don't know anything to do with dinosaurs. I don't know anything to do with Big Bang and all that. That's way beyond my intelligence. All I know is that Jesus has helped me in my times of need, in my little personal environment, that, Lord, that Jesus has healed me of, of an illness I had for years, of severe chronic pain. And through that, all that I don't understand, I don't care about, I'm not a skeptic of any of that because I know Jesus has come and shown himself in my sphere. Jesus has shown himself in where I am. That makes me not a skeptic to any of that. And that's what Jesus will say to a skeptic, that people are skeptical. They want to debate things greater than what they understand. And Jesus says, let me show you where you're at. Let me show you where your little environment is. Let me show you your love and all that. The Lord has told us, don't try and understand it. It's way beyond you. But the Lord has shown himself to me. And he's shown his love to me. And therefore, I'm not as skeptical about anything. That God can come and he can tell me great things that are beyond my understanding. And I say, yes, Lord, because he's shown himself in the small things already. He's shown himself good. He's shown himself loving. He's shown himself caring. He's shown himself as a healer. Therefore, I'm not skeptical that he can heal again. I'm not skeptical for a moment that Jesus rose from the dead because he's shown himself to me. And this is this great idea of what Jesus wants to say to us tonight. That he's saying, I'm going to show you myself for you in your situation. You may be skeptical of great things, but let Jesus show himself in your situation. And from that, your faith grows tremendously for the great things. Your skepticism for the great things doesn't matter anymore. Because the Lord has shown himself on your personal level. And actually, as we said tonight, it's this idea of taking faith. Ask for faith. The scripture says we can ask for more faith. Those who are lacking faith, simply ask for it. The Lord is holding out on a platter that we can take it and we can say, Lord, give me more faith. And he will give it to us. The disciples themselves ask for more faith. Stop seeking loopholes 
or using human rationale, but just take faith. That's exactly what Jesus would say to a skeptic. And as I say, the story of Russell, we still don't know. We love him dearly, but God's good. And, and there's people as well in your own situations, you won't know why God did certain things. You, I don't know, maybe you've lost a loved one and you think God can't be loving because I felt no love in that situation. Or something that God, you felt God promised you and then he took it away and you said, God isn't a provider because I lost in that situation. If you're skeptical at that point, I really want, you know, I went up for it, but please don't leave tonight without getting prayer for it. Let Jesus show himself as good and faithful to the little things, and he'll take away the skepticism. He doesn't mind skepticism. He doesn't mind you having doubts because he's got the proof. However, if you're a cynic, that's when it doesn't show God's heart. That's when it doesn't show what his truth is all about, that we should come before him and ask for more faith. So as Owen comes up, he's going to pray for us tonight. So yeah, Father God, thank you that you're a God that says true, that your scripture tells us that your promises are yes and amen, and we can lean on that every single day, Lord. That your scripture tells us that you rose from the dead, so we lean on that every single day, Lord. That your scripture tells us that you're a healing God, that you're a loving God, that you're a God that will never leave or forsake us. You're a God that has great plans for us, and we can lean on all these promises without any skepticism, Jesus, because you've shown yourself as good, Lord. And if there's anyone here tonight, Jesus, that is a skeptic or even a cynic of you, Lord, I pray that you soften your, their hearts, Lord, that you've got the proof of your love. You've got the proof of your authority and your sovereignty. So Holy Spirit, just come and prove yourself to them tonight, Lord Jesus, that you are the God of miracles, you're the way maker, and you're the Lord of our lives, Lord. Amen.